If you saw lightning in the sky, and we had a little bit of thunder earlier this week, if you saw light in the sky, you say we see lightning and you hear thunder. Thunder is the sound of the air filling the vacuum that was made by that streak of lightning. Lightning burns a hole in the air. So many volts of electricity are in it. But once that lightning disappears, the air comes back together. A bang. Some of you have learned to count the time between seeing a flash of lightning, hearing the thunder, knowing that light travels faster than sound, you can then determine how far away that streak of lightning is. Count. Basic science. The disciples of Jesus Christ, after his death and his resurrection, found themselves in their lives in a vacuum. For three years they had followed Jesus. They'd gone around, watch him teach. Those who have made a comparison or summed up the, the Gospels, the four Gospels, that said there's 250 events that are recorded in the four Gospels of things that Jesus did in his ministry. But at the end of the Gospel of John, John the Beloved, who later became John the Revelator, said if we've recorded everything that Jesus did, there would not be room for all the books that we would have to have put them in. So what's in the Bible and the four Gospels, just the highlights, just a few of the things that Jesus actually did. But Jesus died, pulled the rug out from underneath their feet because now they were not following him around like they had done in the last three years. They're trying to figure out what to do with themselves without Jesus. And so in the scripture that we have here today, and I'm going to draw your attention to Gospel of John chapter 21, and that I think is on page 1546 in the Pew Bible. But I'm going to draw your attention to what the disciples were up to without Jesus. Well, what they did is they went back to what they were comfortable doing. Some of them were fishermen before they met Jesus. So with Jesus not in front of them, now they got to make a living. They got to fill in their time. And in the story that we have, there were only nine of the disciples together. So now there's a little bit of they're separating and going their different ways. But they were trying to fill the time in. They were lost. Pull somebody out of your life and you're lost. You don't want to do it with yourself. Somebody moves away. There's a death in the family. That person is missing. You lived your life around them. They're gone. What do you do? And so we find ourselves here with a story, a very interesting story, and I titled my remarks, Fireside with Jesus. Now what we have in this story is what I call the three F's, the letter F, three of them.
We had food, we had fire, and we had friends. You got those, those, thing, those three things, you got a lot going in your life. Or if you lived on Thame Street, we used to call it Fish Fry Friday. And for years, you could find fish every Friday on Thame Street. I want to read to you just a few verses in this chapter. I'm not going to read to you every verse because the chapter's got 27 verses to it. And I want to read enough that you uh, get a feel for the atmosphere that is here and the dialogue between Jesus and the nine disciples. And in chap chapter 21, in verse 1, and afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. Now, if you read the New Testament, Jesus appeared to the disciples and to others between his resurrection and his ascension to heaven 12 times. And this was one of them. 12 times he was seen after the resurrection. And it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, said Simon Peter. Told them, and they said, okay, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. Later on, we saw there were two boats. But that night, they caught nothing. Sounds like one of my fishing trips. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. That gives me chills. Wouldn't you like to be down by First Beach in Newport, look over and see Jesus standing at the edge of the water? Ah. But the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, you got any fish? <laughs> There's nothing. An un, which a successful fisherman wants to hear from anybody. Did you catch anything? Nobody wants to say no. And I said no, they answered. And he said, well, throw your nets. They didn't use fishing poles, they used nets. Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Oh, I can hear the mumbling. You're right. We've been here all night. We're sick and tired of hauling this net in and there's nothing in it. What do you mean, put it on the right side of the boat? Can't you hear those fishermen grumbling? I can. And he said, throw your net out on the right side of the boat, you'll find some. Jesus knew where the school of fish were. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved which was John, said to Peter, it is the Lord out there on the shoreline. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him, as you know, Peter's the impulsive one. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, jumped into the water, and the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. That would be about 300 feet. And when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish already on it. Where'd they come from? And some bread. What a picture. 
And this story goes on for 27 verses. It is one of the more interesting verses of the Bible. What you find in this chapter here, there was nobody there except Jesus and the disciples. The press wasn't there. The priests weren't there. The rabbis weren't there. The crowd, the multitude that Jesus had lectured to were not there. It was just Jesus and the disciples. Hmm. I think there's not many at church this morning. There was less at this meeting going on between the disciples and Jesus. This is the only place in the Bible that you're going to see recorded they had a men's breakfast. Because the scripture says that on the shore stood Jesus. But he wasn't just standing there. He'd been busy. He had a fire going. I don't know if he found driftwood. I don't know how he got the fire started. I don't know any of that. But it says there were ashes, live ashes there, live coals. There was an act of fire. And there was something else. There's fish already on it. You know that thing the disciples couldn't find? After working all night? There's fish on the fire. And bread. Next to the fish. They had the three F's. Were there. Can't beat it. There was food to eat. There was a fire going to cook and smoke the fish. Reminds me of Don's driveway. You go to his house, there's good food and there's smoking, smoking meat, cooking in the driveway. And there's friends. And the funny part of it is, and it's an unusual comment in scriptures here, where it says the disciples as they were coming in we're not sure that the person that was on the shore was Jesus. Now remember, this is post-resurrection. Did he look the same? Pretty much. It wasn't long after the resurrection, according to Scripture, there was 40 days between the Passover, which was the Last Supper, as we refer to it, the crucifixion, the resurrection. And when Pentecost came along, Pentecost was 50 days from Passover. It was already a name and place. It, the disciples didn't put it there. Pentecost was 50 days. Pente meaning 50. <coughs> 50 days back to the Passover. So we know the time frame that this was in. And Jesus was there. And he said to the disciples, now take your nets and throw them on the other side. <laughs> I wish I had a record and heard the conversation on that boat after Jesus told them, put it over there. Yeah, right, we've thrown this thing in the water so many times we're exhausted. And said Peter taking off his outer garment and got down to his work clothes that he wore when he was fishing and working. And when he decided to jump out of the boat and start swimming to shore, since they were 300 feet out, I don't know how deep the water was at that point. But he had to put something on. You know, it's like when your doorbell rings and you're not dressed for the person at the doorbell, you go grab something. You can answer the door, and that's what Peter did. He put his clothes back on. That made swimming a lot harder, but he did it. Peter's the impulsive one. He's the one that acted before the others. We all need the fast actors and the slow actors. I'm a Scotchman. It takes me days to think about things that have happened. And I finally come up with the answer that other people came up with in five seconds. I have to think about it a while. 
And so the, the boat was coming in. And the scripture says that the net that they put out there was so loaded with fish, big fish. Remember, this is the Sea of Galilee. That's huge. It's like the, the Great Lakes in our country. Sea of Galilee was a big, big sea. Lots of fish. It says there was 153 fish in the net. No way was that getting in the boat. If they did get into the boat, they probably would have tipped it over. And so they were dragging this net, counting on the fish that were trapped in the net to help them swim and get the boat back to shore. Now Jesus reminded them again, hey guys, you catch anything? Oh yeah. I can hear him say, I told you. I knew where the fish were. See, these guys didn't have a fish finder on the boat like we have today. That goes down and looks in the water and shows you all the fish swimming around before you drop your line in. Jesus was the fish finder. So they came ashore. He said, bring some of that fish in here over here. I got a fire going. Can't beat a wood fire. There's something about it. Years ago when I worked outside, we did construction work on the outside. I found the guys who worked on the crew. At the end of the day, when their day was over, they went somewhere where there was direct heat. Soaked it in. Their bodies were cold to the core. They'd worked all day, but the cold had taken their energy. And they'd be in front of a stove or a fireplace or something. Soak in the heat. So Jesus invited each other, come on over guys. Come in now, I've got some stuff going here. Bring me some more fish. This is the guy that fed 5,000, so feed nine disciples. I don't care what their appetite was, no problem. They had plenty of fish that day. And then they got into conversation. It says none of them dared to ask Jesus if it was really him. <laughs> that little thing in the back of their head still saying, is this really Jesus? Days ago, weeks ago, he was dead. They put him in a tomb. This is really Jesus? See, we're not traveling together every day now. He wasn't at the center of the group. They were on their own. Their lives were empty because Jesus was not with them every day but like he had been for three years. Whole new experience on their own. And now Jesus, after he got them together there, if I read the rest of the passage, and you need to read it when you go home if you haven't already scanned down through it, there was a dialogue between Peter and Jesus. Because you remember the last thing that Peter did was deny Jesus. Well, if you were there, the whole world would, had gone against the man you would follow and said he was the son of God. And it got so bad they actually killed him. He wouldn't exactly been a, a uh, what should I say, free of fear. A little damsel got Peter in trouble. And Jesus, at the Last Supper, told Peter, before the cock crows the next morning, whatever time that is, five o'clock earlier, he said, you're going to deny me three times. He looked at him and says, no way. Jesus said, yes way. So they got together here, and Peter and Jesus had a discussion with, with Peter. Everybody knew what went on. No secret. This wasn't something that happened in the corner. Everybody knew that Peter had denied that he was one of them.
Jesus said to him, do you love me? You know, for years I read this passage of Scripture and I thought, here's a dialogue of Jesus scolding Peter for what he did. And I've seen something different in it. This time as I was reading it, I saw a different scenario going on. This was a case of Jesus loving Peter back. Jesus had already forgiven him. But he was loving him back. He said, Peter, do you love me? But he did it in front of everybody. Love is like a heat lamp. You know how you, some of you have bathrooms that have red lanterns in them in the ceiling that if you take a shower or something, you feel that warmth coming down. Or if you don't have one, sometimes you go to a hotel, motel, whatever, and they have one. Oh, that feels nice. Love is like a heat lamp. You soak it in. And what Jesus was doing to Peter in this dialogue, he was healing the heart of Peter. Peter, do you love me? That meant Peter had to say something. He said, yes, I do. And he says, Peter, if you do, then feed my sheep. Now, Jesus didn't have 3,000 sheep tied up somewhere. We're the sheep. So he said to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Sheep. Yeah, Peter says, yeah, okay. Hmm. Love. The Dutchman said, better felt than tell. They say if you give a person, science has proved this, I can't give you all the names and the details, but if you hug a person for more than 20 seconds, this has been proven. If you hug a person for more than 20 seconds, there's something that goes on between the two of you. There's an actual exchange that goes on from hugging a person more than 20 seconds. That's why when you're done, a hug feels so good. Something happens physically between you as a result of a hug. It's not hocus pocus. It can prove it. I can't tell you the long names of what happens, but they've proved it. This is why the the pandemic was so damaging to us, because we're made to be people to support each other, love each other, Nourish each other. Pandemic blew us all apart. Move over. Six more feet. Got to stay away. Don't touch anybody. Don't shake hands. Don't give anybody a hug. Hmm. Love. Like a heat lamp. My dear Patricia, I like to get under her skin once in a while. Oh, no, no, you. Oh, yes, I did. Men like to get a reaction out of women. It's something that we do. We say nice things. We say kind things. We say, we say things that are irritating. Things just to spin you around after we say it. What are we after? We just want your attention. You won't stop men from doing it. Run a restaurant. They come in for the coffee, but they come in, see the waitress. They'll say something to the waitress that gets her attention. But I used to tell my dear Patricia once in a while, I love you more than you love me. Oh, 
that got under her skin so bad. She says, no, you cannot. I love you more. And I will always love you more than you love me. I agree with her, but I used to say that just to get her started. All of you men, the love you give to your girls, your partners, whatever, you can never outlove a woman. Never. Buy her a bag of groceries, she gives you a meal. Build her a house or a home, and she gives you a home. A woman is the multiplier. She always gives back to you more than you've given to her. Give her a credit card and tell her to go shopping. You say, oh, yeah, I don't dare to do that. But give her a credit card and tell her to go shopping. She comes back with beautiful dresses on, looks so nice. You enjoy going places with her. Ah, this is my what? Why? Took a simple credit card and turned it into something that pleases your eyes and makes you happy. And never out love a woman. But I used to say that to Pat just to get her go. Worked every time. Love. Jesus was loving Peter in this passage of Scripture. And so Peter had denied Jesus three times. So Jesus came back at him, said, Peter, number two, do you love me? Yes, Jesus, I love you. He's trying to heal the depth of the hurt that was in Peter's heart when he realized that he had betrayed his Lord and now he had carried around that hurt within him. You know those things in your life that happen in a split second and you wish you'd give anything to get that time back again and you could do a rerun? Life doesn't have reruns. Music does. Movies do. Life does not have a rerun. You got one try at it. You have a starting point and an ending point, but you can't back it up. You can't rerun it. So Jesus asked them the second time, what was Jesus doing? He was soaking love and forgiveness into the heart of Peter. Like the heat ray. Just soaking it in. A little time went on in their gathering there. Jesus came back at Peter a third time. Peter! Yes, my Lord. Do you love me? Now Peter's annoyed. He's aggravated. He doesn't understand what Jesus is doing. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. Why are you asking me a third time? Because you denied me three times. I'm forgiving you three times. I'm filling your heart with my love three times. I'm going to make you a new person. You know why, Peter? I'm going to build my church on you. I'm going to use you in the days to come and in the decades in, in front of us. After I go back to heaven, you're going to play a critical role in the church. And you'll never deny me again. Peter, I love you. Ooh. You had to have heard it yourself to have felt it ring right through. And the other eight disciples were sitting back to say, man, what's going on here? They could feel it. Jesus radiating at Peter, forgiveness and love until that hurt that was in Peter's heart. I wish he'd give anything to have gone back and be able to rerun that night. That horrible night. Jesus was forgiving him and healing him and putting his love in him.
Love makes you who you are. Fear will keep you away from doing some things in life. But love is the most powerful emotion that you will ever feel in your life. There's one woman in every man's life that can change him. Love. Only one woman. Love will make you better. Love will make you truer. My love will bring out the good things in you, in life. It'll make you stand taller. It'll make your hands do more. The power of love. That's what Jesus was doing to Peter that day. He was pouring his love into him. Peter, I forgive you. I love you. I hope you've had that kind of a conversation with God in your own heart, in your own life. And to God, you know that I love you. You know how much I love you. I love you beyond words. Feel it. Forgiveness. Three denials. And three I forgives you. And I love you. Only Jesus can heal the hurt in your heart. You know, we're all human. Some days we hurt each other. We don't mean to. Sometimes we say things and don't realize it came out different than you thought you were saying it. It became a zinger to somebody else. They were hurt by it. They didn't see it the way, the same way you thought you said it. Didn't come out that way to them. Love. Forgiveness. And there was one more thing that Jesus did with Peter. He talked about the future. If you read church history, Peter was crucified. And at the time that he was crucified, he said to those who did it to him, turn my cross upside down. I'm not worthy I had to be crucified like my Lord was. Put my head down. He still felt the hurt. Have him and didn't hide his blood. All of us would like to know the future. Every one of us sitting here want to go to heaven, but not today. <laughs> we all want to live. The survival instinct, very real within our hearts. But someday, God has called us home. Some of you have listened on the TV to a Bible teacher, a good Bible teacher. Charles Stanley, out of Atlanta. Every Sunday morning I used to be on. He died two weeks ago at the age of 90. God called him home. He's with his Lord now. All of us have a future. We don't know when it is, how it is, under what circumstances. But we all have a future and God knows where it is and what it is. I would have loved to have been on the seaside and enjoyed the three F's that those disciples enjoyed that day. Food and the fire and their friends. I would love to have felt the forgiveness that was coming out of the words of Jesus and the reassurance that also they all had this really is Jesus. That God will ensure your heart of his presence and the reality of his presence.
in your life. Keep the fires burning between you and the Lord. Keep the fires burning between you and others. Keep the fires burning between you and your companions. About a week before Pat died, her strength was fading. She was in the hospital at St. Anne's. I decided I was going to give her a hug. Had been in the bed so long for weeks. I reached around her, got my hand underneath her all the way around, and then I picked her up. Real hug. I looked at her after I did that, her eyes, the twinkle that she would get when she was really happy. They were glowing. I had woken up something inside her. Love. Real love. That was my last hug to her. Let love be our motivation. Jesus said to the church in general, this command I leave with you. Love one another. David, come on up. We're going to sing the benediction together.